Hey, um, good evening and uh, welcome to everybody as usual. Special welcome to anybody that's new to our Zoom sessions. Um, if you are, my name is Alan Friedman. I'm Vice President of the Australian Jewish Association and I will be the MC for this evening. Um, also visible on your screens, as you will have seen, are David Adler, the President of the AJA, and also um, Yishai Fleischer, who we'll introduce in, to, in a moment, so good evening to you. And as usual with our sessions, we'll be speaking with Yishai for about 30 minutes, after which we will open up the discussion with a live Q&A session from the audience, so, so please have some questions ready. And as usual, I remind people to signal your, your interest in asking a question by clicking on the participants tab at the bottom of the screen and then click on the raise hand or a green tick so that we get so that you get our attention and then we know that you uh, you want to ask a, a question. Uh, the chat function is available um, as usual so feel free to to use that during the discussion and as David mentioned everybody's been muted and that's designed to pre prevent all those annoying noises during the first part of the session but you will be able to unmute yourself during question time. Okay Yishai Fleischer will be well known to many of you as he visited Australia in 2018 as a guest of the AJA and drew large crowds at all his venues. He is one of the most capable, articulate and informed Israel advocates and is the international spokesperson for the Jewish community of Hebron. Yishai is also an Israeli broadcaster and a frequent columnist for major news websites both in Israel and abroad. Um, Although he, uh, he already had a high public profile, it was in 2017 uh, in an article that he wrote for the New York Times outlining the various options for dealing with the, the Palestinian Arabs other than the two-state solution that added to his international prominence as an Israeli commentator, particularly in the US. He has a law degree in rabbinic ordination and is a paratrooper in the IDF reserves and lives with his family on the Mount of Olives in Jerusalem. Yishai, welcome back to Australia. It's good to catch up with you again. Thank you very much, Alan, and thank you, David. And it's fun to be with, uh, with Australia. I think that welcoming me to Australia is, is a little <laughs> bit of an exaggeration. Uh, well, uh, I always virtually. tell people that, I tell people that Australia is one of the places that a, a, a person should try to visit in their life. It's, it's such a beautiful and, and important place to kind of just see God's, uh, God's God's creativity, God's beauty. Uh, and so I'm, I'm, I am in the land of Israel, which I'm very happy to be in right now, <laughs> but I'm certainly not in Australia. I'm just with no. you on Zoom, but thank God for this technology. And it's great to be with you guys. Yeah, it works well. Yishai, the US election has been and gone, and it's probably fair to say that there, we, we don't know what's going on and there could be some changes um, made. Now, if we, if we do uh, end up with a Biden government, um, can, can we... I mean, I imagine we'll be able to see well, there will be some changes in, in its approach towards Israel and its conflict with the Palestinian Arabs and, and the impact of, of Iran in the Middle East. So um, how do you read what's been happening in the US? How do you see the next four years unfolding for uh, Judea and Samaria under a Biden-Harris administration, if that's indeed what we get? Okay, so... Uh, thanks again, Alan. Uh, great question uh, about the future of, of the United States. Let's just say what we all know, which is nobody can understand the future of the United States anymore. And in general, politics has become a very um, unpredictable game, more than in the past, I think, more than in the past. Maybe it's just the way of social media. Maybe it's it's the distrust in um, uh, that, that politicians have garnered. Uh, it's very hard to tell. Here in Israel, for example, we had three elections one after the other, and then a government that is basically not working well. And again, on the radio, everybody's talking about Israeli elections. So it's very hard to predict now. It's hard to predict the voter, and it's hard to predict the political players. In the United States, you know better than I do. I know you guys watch uh, what's going on in, in the United States very closely. And so I don't have a lot of comments on what's going to be. Uh, but in American football, uh, you have... Uh, a team that's in American football, when, when they're on the field, there's an offensive team. And then when the ball goes to the other side, you go to defense and a different team comes on board. All I mean to say is sometimes you play offense, sometimes you play defense. It's like a different modality. It's not like soccer where you just switch mental mode and just become defense. It's like sometimes there's a whole different team that, that goes there to hold the line. And probably under uh, a Biden 
Harris administration, we're just going to have to switch into a defensive mode. I mean, the guess is is really quite simple. A Biden administration is like an Obama Biden administration. That's not so. If people say to me, people say to me, they're like, uh, Biden's not Obama. I go, I think he is Obama because he was the Obama Biden administration. So he was the vice president for that administration. He is in the same mindset. Uh, moreover, he, he Biden, when he came to town to Israel, he made a um, uh, he made sh- last time he came to town, he made sure to berate the prime minister for building in 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 a normative part of Jerusalem, and we we know what uh, what Biden could be about, but what's going to be an American who's really going to win that election? I really don't know, and in fact, I'm a little bit tired of thinking about it. I'm a little bit tired of thinking about it because my business is to help build the Jewish state. Uh, and uh, and help uh, people come to the consciousness of the centrality of Israel in our time. And that's what I'm about. I'm not about uh, America. Uh, that being said, let's just take a second and answer your question a little bit more tightly, a little bit more specifically. Uh, the, the, the Trump administration had tremendous successes. I'm guessing that people that are right now at this, uh, on this session are pro-Israel people for the most part. Now, we remember as pro-Israel people that we used to live with tons of kind of well-known lies, public lies. I'll give you an example. The UN was an anti-Semitic body, and we all knew it. We all lived with it. We all lived with our lies constantly, and we saw them uh, regularly condemn us, call us an occupier, tell us that we don't have any rights in Jerusalem and, or in Hebron, etc. We lived with that. Suddenly, and, and we were used to that. We were just like, that's, say la vie, right? Right, Alan? You just say, well, that's, that's just the you know, UN. That's just the way it is. Suddenly, there came an administration which said, wait a minute. We have to put a stop to this international sanctioned anti-Semitism. And they went at the UN, went straight at them. Now, personally, I was involved with a subset of the UN called UNESCO. Now, UNESCO recognizes World Heritage Sites. And what they did was that they decided that the tomb of the ancestors in Hebron was actually a Palestinian world heritage site under threat from Israel. So this 2000 year old Jewish building on top of tombs that are 3,800 years old Jewish tombs was now a Palestinian site. So this was absurd. But the fight that I started in Hebron ended up with the Trump administration leaving UNESCO on the grounds that this was anti-Semitism against Israel and against Hebron. And they literally left that organization. I mean, it was boom. It was like unbelievable. They pulled out all their money and all their support. And there were many other such lies that we lived with. If it's the lie uh, that the two-state solution is the only way to go and that you have to solve the, the, the Palestinian problem before moving ahead, that was, that was completely, utterly destroyed by the Abraham Accords that showed that, that you didn't have to have a two-state solution in order to move ahead with regional peace and prosperity. Uh, if it's that... Jerusalem is the capital of Israel. We lived with the lie that the United States of America, Israel's greatest ally, was against the idea that Jerusalem is the capital of Israel. It was a horrific, absurd lie that we all lived with. And me as an American also, I was like, I love America or I respect America at least, but this thing really stuck every day. I would wake up in the morning and know that America does not recognize our capital. It was very painful. Came at administration, Turned it upside down. I happen to have been in Australia when the embassy move uh, exactly happened. I think I was at David's house uh, early in the morning watching the, the events happening in Jerusalem. Uh, I think it was around Yom Yerushalayim. Remember. That, that's right. It was Yom Yerushalayim. Uh, in any case, uh, v- very powerful lies that we lived with were eviscerated. And so a lot of us kind of, you know, and, and you know, we as, as modern human beings, we kind of forget history. So we don't remember that we lived with all these lies or that the Golan wasn't recognized, et cetera, et cetera. Oh, or in the biggest, one of the biggest lies of them all, that the United States was the funder of the Palestinian Authority's budget, which 400 million of which, 400 million dollars of which went to pay the family of murderers of the Jewish people. Like the United States, our ally was funding today's neo-Nazis. It was an impossible thing. It was just, we lived with these things inside every day. And it was always like something was bothering us inside. Suddenly came an administration that turned it all around. And um, 
and we made tremendous gains. We made tremendous gains and we didn't hide it. We didn't hide it. For example, at, at this, at, a few days ago, uh, uh, two days before the US, um, uh, the US people went to, to vote to elections, to the polls, uh, I was an MC of an event of mayors of, uh, and, and, um, and uh, governors in Judea and Samaria uh, praying for Trump at the tomb of the uh, tomb of the ancestors. Now, that's an unheard of thing. Like we went out on a political limb to support an American uh, president. But why did we do that? Very simple reason. You went out on a limb for us. We'll go out on a limb for you. Now, if it's a Biden administration, does that mean that we're going to just throw up our hands and and that's it? We can't work with these people and it's back to the old way. First thing, I think the ga- some of the gains that were made are going to stick. Uh, for example, the recognition of Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. Other gains under a Biden potential Biden administration would probably be lost. For example, I'm sure that they'll start refunding the Palestinian Authority. But I think that I think the question is, can we use some of those gains inside of ourselves and say we learned that this is the truth showed itself, and that we could strive for a truth. And I, I see that people remember whatever gains were done under, under President Reagan, and everybody remembers Reagan. Not that I think, by the way, Reagan was so great for Israel, but like we can hold on to those gains of, of this Trump administration and say, this is a truth that's shown through, and this is what we should strive for. And Israel, you know, has uh, the Jewish people have been around for 3,800 years. Israel has had two commonwealths, and we're reborn in the third one now. I think that we'll be able to move forward uh, with any admin, American administration. It might be a little rougher. It might be a little bumpier. But uh, our job is to move the project forward. Thank you, Thank you. David. Uh, Yeshai, uh, seeing uh, you raise the issue of truths, I'd like to ask you a double-barrel question on on truths. Um, firstly, briefly, can you can you tell us what's happening in Hebron uh, this week? Why this week is particularly important? And you mentioned in passing the um, the Abraham Accords. Um, Amongst the communities in Judea and Samaria, both the Jews and the Arabs, um, how, how is that, that set of initiatives being received? Okay, so uh, thank you, David. The, uh, this week is a very important week for the Jewish community of Hebron. During the uh, Oslo Accords, uh, which we thought of as dreaded and empowering a Palestinian authority over our land and then creating a terrorist state uh, within, uh, within the borders of Israel, uh, with, during that time, uh, there, there was also the Hebron Accords, I think in 94, in which there was really was a giveaway of large parts of Hebron to the Palestinian Authority, and very quickly afterwards, uh, a t- terrorist uh, efforts to destroy the small Jewish community there. And one of the things that, that we came up with then was the idea of making the Torah portion of Chaye Sarah, which is in the book of Genesis, and, the, and we, read it, we read the Torah sequentially every year, there is a Torah portion called Chaye Sarah on this Sabbath, this coming Sabbath, which talks about the purchase of Abraham, his first purchase in the land of Israel, which is a, a purchase of a burial plot for the first family of Israel. Today it's known as the Tomb of the Ancestor or, or Tomb of the Patriarchs and Matriarchs. Uh, and we have turned over the last 30 years uh, this Sabbath into a giant festival, which is a cross between uh, the Bible and Woodstock, and it kind of comes together on this Shabbat, and and it's ba- basically about thirty to forty thousand people show up in Kiryat Arba Chevron in festival style tents and and uh, and uh, mobile homes and all that kind of stuff, uh, and uh, people stay in every which possible fashion, sleeping on the grass, whatever it could be, uh, and also about about ten uh, percent of the Knesset shows up, ministers and Knesset members show up to show solidarity. I was at the Knesset just this Monday um, and I was filming Knesset members to send their blessings for Hebron. I couldn't, I couldn't get them not to, to jump in front of the camera to say it because so many Knesset members are in favor of Jewish rights in Hebron, even though it's a contested and tricky place uh, surrounded by, by Palestinian authority control. And so this is a very important Shabbat. However, David, I want you to know that this year under the COVID restrictions, there will be no guests in Hebron, and oh. uh, and that's right. And so it is. It is. It is. The police are going to be really, really strict about it. And you know, though, it's really for the good because everybody's just so um, uh, 
uh, yearning for Hebron. Everybody's yearning for Hebron so much. And so we're going to run a, a big, uh, a big donation campaign here on the Israeli side and in two weeks on the American side and the Anglo side. So, um, so it's, you know, it's for the good, but, but that's, that's this weekend. Now, what was the second part of your question? The, the Abraham Accords and how it's being received by the two communities there. Okay. So for the Jews, the Abraham Accords is a very exciting time. And for, for nationalists, so-called right-wingers like myself, uh, it's actually a very important thing on two levels. On one level, it's important that we're, we've proven now that you don't need to cut up the land of Israel and divide it and create a Palestinian authority to have regional understanding, regional cooperation, regional realignment. And then there's that word peace. I don't use the word peace too much uh, because I find that it's um, uh, too high of expectations. I think that we have to have regional step-by-step, uh, -step, regional coordination, regional alignment, regional trade, regional prosperity, and, and, and understanding really. And I like the word harmony better than peace because the word peace has been hijacked. Some people get angry at me and they say, Yishai, peace, shalom, is one of the names of God. In Judaism, shalom is one of the names of God. It's a beautiful thing. And I say to them, just like the name of God, don't take it in vain. D don't overuse that word, okay? That's what I tell people. So, so for us, it's very exciting. Moreover, it proves that we Jews and Israelis and so-called settlers and so-called uh, uh, right-wingers and nationalists we, are not, we have a problem with, we don't have an, a racial problem with Arabs. We're not against their ethnicity. We're against the land takeover. And we're against the jihad, which is a, 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 a very intolerant attitude. We don't have a problem with Arabs. And so when, when you see right now, there is an Israeli delegation from Samaria at, in Dubai and, and the UAE in general right now, but led by Mayor Yossi Dagan, so that proves that we don't have a, a, a racial problem with, with Arabs. We are actually family. Uh, we, we're part of the same, we're part of the same, you know, Abrahamic tradition. We're children of Abraham. We're in the Abrahamic region. And so for us, this is a very valuable, very valuable uh, uh, initiative. And we want to see it push forward. For example, I want to get uh, UAE investors to help build a hotel in Hebron in Hebron, which was going to be a joint Arab-Jewish hotel next to the Tomb of the Ancestors. We'll call it the Ibrahimi Hotel or the Abraham Hotel, which will serve Jews, Arabs, Christians, whoever it is, but will be the hosts, the children of Abraham. Okay, so we're very into it. Um, the, other, the other side, which I've written about um, that is so important to us is that the Abraham Accords, the very name itself is very, very wise and very helpful. Why is that? Because one of the most pernicious lies that David, people like you have to fight in Australia and we have to fight in, in the campuses all around the world is one ugly word, word, which splits into many other ugly words, but the main ugly word is occupation. The word occupation that is being used as a cudgel against Israel means that we are foreigners. We are abusers. We're not from here. We're white interlopers, European colonialists. So then you have a host of other words, colonialist, and, 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 and apartheid and a million other words that, that are part of this um, under the umbrella of occupation, which is the main cudgel against Israel in the, what I call the narrative war uh, on campuses and in the media, et cetera. What is the one word that defeats the theory of occupation? Indigenous. Occupation meaning, what's that? Indigenous, indigenous. right? Indigenous, right. You're absolutely correct. But there's a word that, 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 that says it better in PR terms and in, and in emotional terms, that one word is Abraham. If we are the children of Abraham, then we are indigenous. We are tribal. We're an ethnic people, a Semitic people from this land. We're ancient in this land. And we and the Arabs are on par. It puts us in a totally different mindset. And so that's why people like myself have been promoting the word Abraham Accords so far and wide. Uh, uh, much more important to me, the Abraham Accords than deal of the century, et cetera, or peace to prosperity. Abraham Accords says something about me that's, and about Israel and about Jewish people living in Hebron. If I'm part of the Abraham Accords, it's because I'm the, the children of Abraham. And here's where Abraham is buried here in the land. And we're from here. 
So uh, on those two levels, but you also asked me, uh, just to recap, you, you said, I say it's important to us in terms of our relationships with regional Arabs. Uh, it'll, it'll promote prosperity, tourism, technology, defense against Iran, joint defense. If we have, you know, a stakehold on the beaches of Dubai, that's right across uh, the, uh, the, the waterway from Iran. And, you know, people can take a hint why that could be useful to us. Um, <laughs> but it also is important in terms of the narrative war. Now, with regarding to Arabs, what do they think? Not so easy to know. Not so easy to know. Some Arabs tell me, um, and talking with Arabs is not easy because they're oftentimes afraid. Okay, they're oftentimes afraid of the brutal Palestinian, brutal and repressive Palestinian authority. So they cannot show a lot of, you know, a lot of emotion about it publicly because if they could, they would say, hey, the Dubai folks, they know what they're doing. Obviously, they take money and turn their desert into a flourishing place. You know, I wish we could do that. Look at Gaza City, a place that is on the beautiful Mediterranean. Uh, really, one of the best beaches on the Mediterranean is, is the Gaza area. People don't think of it that way, but that, I used to vacation in the Gaza area. Uh, but look what Dubai has taken their land and done. And look what, you know, the, the Hamas folks have done which is uh, what we call euphemistically in, 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 uh, in our ancient language, drek. Okay, they haven't done anything with it. It, it looks like garbage over there. So, so, so many Arabs are thinking, why do they have the Abraham Accords and we can't get the Abraham Accords? On the other hand, uh, one cannot deny that jihadism is still deeply rooted um, in the Gaza Strip, in Hebron, uh, in nearby places like Egypt, and Jordan and Syria. In Syria, they have state-sponsored jihadism in the form of Hezbollah, um, also state-sponsored in the form of Hamas, Iranian-sponsored, and also Islamic Jihad. And so, uh, and in the Sinai, we have ISIS. Uh, we have the ISIS Sinai province. So, look, we are we are we we want to move ahead with the Abraham Accords, but let's put it this way: we're not we're not putting down our guns anytime soon because jihadism is still a very prominent milieu uh, in the thinking of, of some regional Arabs. And so, so that's, that's another reason actually why the Abraham Accords is so important. It's important to help some Arabs come to what I now call, I came up with a new term, I call it post-jihadism, okay? You have to come to the conclusion of post-jihadism. And the key foundation to post-jihadism is to understand that Israel is not defeatable, undefeat, un undefeatable. No, that you cannot defeat it. Um, impregnable okay it's it, you're not you're never going to defeat israel and therefore you might as well sue for harmony because it'll better you in the long run and you're not going to get anything from a fruitless war so those are some of the attitudes around here uh but but it's 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 varied and when it takes root even more more people will come to our side yeah um i think michael wanted to ask something along those lines yes uh, hi uh, yeshai i think the last time i was there you took me on a lovely tour of hevron good um, to see you michael yeah. Um, uh, Yishai, do you think that the Biden-Harris administration will try to end the U.S. alliance with uh, Saudi Arabia? I don't think... First thing, it's, it's important to understand that there's been a big change. One of the big changes from uh, the 70s was that the Arabs used to control oil, global oil, and energy, and ga natural gas. Today, that's not, the tr that's not a fact anymore, and the United States is the world's greatest oil producer. And that, that really is a humongous turnaround, which also affects global economy, which also affects the jihad, uh, uh, jihad's coffers, and also affects the way Saudi Arabia used to th thinks. It, it, it used to think we have both oil, we control the world through this energy, and we have this Wahhabi ideology that we want to send out. Now, uh, that has drained up. I mean, say they no longer control, they still have a lot of oil and gas, but they don't control the world market anymore. And there's two more factors. The factors are that uh, there's the Iranian threat. Never underestimate the, 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 how seriously the Saudis understand the Iranian threat. And there's another factor, which is there's a new generation of leadership. If it's uh, MBS, Mohammed bin Salman in Saudi Arabia, or MBZ, Mohammed bin Zayed 
in, uh, in, uh, in the UAE. Uh, and, and these younger leaders, I think that they're done with the old wars and they're looking for to reform the political and therefore the religious uh, relationship of, of Islam to Israel. By the way, uh, one of the most important things that have happened recently is that the, the, the Saudi Arabia has allowed Israeli flyovers over its airspace. Do not think that's a small thing. In the Middle East, that's a huge thing. It's a sign. It's a, it's a gesture. Uh, now, with regarding to, to Biden-Harris, I really don't know. Um, they have made a, there have been some, some uh, sounds that have been made about them trying to, um, you know, bring, bring Saudi Arabia to task for Khashoggi. What, what was his name again? Uh, you know, the, the killing of the... Kish yeah, the, the, Khashoggi. Yeah, Khashoggi, whatever, the, the killing of this, uh, of this reporter and, and, and bring them to task and, and bringing some kind of tension to bear. Or maybe they're going to be more pro-Iranian. They've already signaled that, and that itself um, is, is, is a split between, uh, between the United States and Saudi Arabia because if you empower Iran, you're basically disempowering Saudi Arabia. Uh, be that it is as it may, what I'm really concerned about is the Israeli... Saudi relationship, which is really not so simple for Saudi Arabia to swallow the Jewish state. Saudi Arabia thinks itself as the leader of the Muslim world. Uh, there's always a tension between Egypt and Saudi Arabia. And th both of those are trying to come to terms with some way to, to actually accept Israel into the region. Again, Abraham Accords are a very important part of that in terms of even the imagery. I think that what, what is going to be very important in the near future is the Islamic dialogue. If Islam can come to some uh, detente, to some, to some understanding about Israel, uh, maybe, maybe in the lines of what the Catholic Church came to in the 60s, which is called Nostra Aetate, which is like, okay, we're still the chosen religion, but Jews have a covenant with God. And so too, if, if the Muslims would come to a similar type of conclusion, Islam is the chosen religion, but still the Jews have their own thing. And it says it in our Quran in a few verses. Uh, that's going to be a, a very important thing to help ameliorate the relationship between, help smooth the relationship between Israel and Saudi Arabia. And so my answer to your question is, if Saudi Arabia and the U.S. have a split, we say to Saudi Arabia, hey, you need defense. We could be your, your defense contractor here in the Middle East. We just need your help with the Palestinian problem. And that would be a wonderful way for us to give uh, each other, have each other's back. You deal with the Palestinian problem in various ways, and we'll help you with your Iranian problem. Um, that's one way that I could see, a positive way that I could see out of uh, a, a split between the US and Saudi Arabia. Okay, David, I'll throw back to you. Just before I do, uh, people, um, now's the time to start thinking of some questions. If you want to, um, if you've got anything on, on your mind, I can see a couple of questions on the chat, which we can come to. Um, but uh, if you want to ask a question, uh, we've got a couple of hands up, so that's good. Um, David, you can... Uh, you I'll, can... Just, I'll just do uh, one, one last thing. Uh, um, I'm sharing a photo, Yishai. Can you see it? Yes, sir. Yeah. Um, can you tell us what that's a, the, the significance of that photo? Because when I walked around Hebron with you, I saw a number of these signs. Um, there's, um, as we said before, there's like a war of narratives, or what I call the narrative war, and um, one of the one of the efforts uh, has been. Let me take a step back. When you want to uproot something, where do you grab it? by the root. And so uh, the enemies of Israel have a keen sense, a keen sense of what the roots of, of Israel are, while sometimes Jews don't have as keen of a sense of what the roots of Israel are. For Israel, the roots of Israel is Tel Aviv and modern Zionism and Herzl and economy and television and culture and all these things. But for the Arabs, they have a keen sense that the real roots of the Jewish people are in the three places that the sages tell us that the forefathers and mothers purchased and that is uh, the tomb of the ancestors in Hebron in Hebron the tomb of Joseph in Shechem which the Arab called Nablus and the, the Temple Mount uh, which the Arabs called the, the Haram al Sharif or now they've changed its name to the Al-Aqsa compound or complex and so these three places which are both holy historical uh, are also strategic.
And so they have gone through many efforts to try to hold on to those places through uh, population expansion, uh, through terror, uh, destroying the tomb of Joseph and kicking out the, Jew the Jews there, uh, controlling the, the Jewish presence on the Temple Mount through the Jordanian Waqf in, in that, that controls this spot in Jerusalem, uh, and in Hebron through intimidation and also through uh, what I call the narrative war, which is the effort to erase our connection. In fact, the effort is to erase every intellectual construct of Zionism, to erase the importance of the Bible, to erase Jewish history and turn it into a bad history of a, of a, of a colonialist people uh, who, who are doing a Holocaust today and apartheid on others. And really, and, and archeology, span a constant battle against the veracity of archeology. span and so in Hebron, the narrative war takes the form of that the Jews are extremists and that they're stealing Palestinian land and that no longer can the Palestinians live in any normalcy or decency and can't visit their mom and can't go to school because there's these nasty settlers who've expropriated their land, et cetera, et cetera. And that sign that you showed is really the, uh, our effort to countermand that, those lies by saying, wait a minute, the Jewish people have been living in this town with, without break almost for 2000 years. Uh, in the 1500s, we already built up a big synagogue. Uh, the, the exiles from Spain came to, uh, to, to Hebron and built up a synagogue and built up a Jewish quarter. And this all existed until 1929 when a horrific jihadist riot swept through the town and killed 67 Jews, murdered 67 Jews in a horrific fashion. And then the British were in charge at the time and they kicked us out of Hebron for the first time in 2000 years and made the land Yudenrein. They ethnically cleansed the Jews from the town. And now you're claiming that we're stopping your life when we make up only 3% of this town and exist on one defensive street? That's absurd. And it's, an, it's a narrative war lie. And we do our best to show the truth and the history of, of Hebron while also keeping it light. You know, I can't all day long remind people about the 1929 riots because that also hurts my tourism. I can't be talking about death all the time. I have to be talking about life. And so, and so we're trying to make it into a touristic de destination. This is the tomb of Abraham. In fact, we're renaming Hebron City of Abraham. Just that simple. That's the, that's the slogan, Hebron City of Abraham. Um, and so it's, it's an, an incredibly important battle. But that sign that you showed was our effort, one of our efforts to countermand the, the incessant lies that we are somehow, um, that we are somehow uh, uh, destroying Arab life and, and, our, and our encroaching on them. It's quite the opposite. Our Jewish life was destroyed and now we're coming back strong. Okay, thank you. Okay, we'll, um, we'll open up to the audience now. Um, Leon, you were first and then Dennis. And if anybody else wants to ask a question, now's the time to indicate. Now, Leon doesn't have a camera, so um, please unmute yourself and ask your question, Leon. Uh, good evening, uh, Yishai. Can you hear me? I hear you great, Leon. Good to hear from you. Yes. Now, Yishai, um, I've asked other people this question, other guest speakers. Um, I'd like to ask you the same question. Um, what do you think motivates the US Democratic Party to empower Iran now, the Iranian regime is a Shiite regime. To appease that regime uh, alienates, alienates the majority, would, one would think would alienate the majority of Muslims in the world who are Sunni. Now, um, I can't reconcile that, uh, those facts with the, the contention that the American effort to empower Iran is simply appeasement of Muslim regret. Let's not forget, for example, that the Twin Towers were destroyed by Sunni Muslims, not Shiite Iranian ones. So what motivates the US, the Democratic Party of the US, to empower Iran? Um, it's, it's an interesting question, Leon. It, 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 uh, the, the, the answer is, you, you asked it specifically about about Iran, but one could one could really one could really ask that question about a whole a whole panoply of values 
which um, everybody hears me. I, I, you just got to sound okay. a little different. Everybody can hear me out no. there? All good. All good. Okay. Sure. Okay, good. It's, it, it, I, you know what, let me, Leon, let me, let me take a step back. I want to, I want to say something. My job is, although I, I think about these things, my job is not to analyze and understand America and their relationship with other places. I, I sound like an American, uh, but, but my blood is blue and white. And, uh, and, and, I think I think about Israel and, and pushing it forward. And so I can only answer that question in so far as it's important to, to, to Israel. I think I, I did that already. But, but with regarding to just trying to touch on what you're saying, look, there, there's a whole host of values. I think that President Obama tried to empower every uh, regime here in the Middle East that was more extremist and more radical and more jihadist. If it was the Muslim Brotherhood, and if it, if it was to kind of um, uh, destabilization is the way that people like President Obama work for their global agenda. That's the way I understand it. They, they want to see, uh, they're Marxist. They want to see class warfare. A new kind of class warfare is, is you know, racial warfare or, or, or regional tensions. And in their mind, uh, when when the new world will arise from the kind of ashes of the old world. Maybe I'm exaggerating a little bit, but that's the way my, my Russian background, my parents are both Russian, came from the Soviet Union. That's the way I understand these kind of folks. My mom said something very famous very, in our family and, and very funny. She said about President Obama, she said, he's not black, he's not white, he's not Muslim, he's not Christian, he's not green, he's red. That's what she said, okay? So that was that was her statement. Again, this is not exactly my field, but but I feel that these type of people, what what they want to do is to they want to do subversive acts, destabilization acts. To them, the Jewish state is something that is bothersome. Conservative ideas are bothersome, and they sometimes empower enemies in order to uh, in order un unscrupulous enemies in order to both benefit personally uh, and also strike at their enemies that they can't strike at directly. You know the demo. Now, not all Democrats are like that. You know, many good Jewish, decent Democrats and other Democrats. There's a lot of very good, decent people. But the so-called jihad squad would not blink at seeing Israel get nuked. Uh, <laughs> that's just the truth. And so, and so uh, they like to empower these kind of forces to do their, to outsource the Holocaust. But you know what? Why don't you ask another question, Leon? What about Germany? Why would Germany be so in cahoots with Iran? Why, you know, why are they so interested? They they have financial gain from Iran. It's a huge market, but they but you know maybe there are forces today that don't want to do the Holocaust because it's uh, it's you know it's 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 uh, it doesn't look good on the resume, but uh, but maybe you outsource it to somebody else. Maybe that's some some clues for you about about how some people are thinking, but. Uh, my, my question, as I said before, is really uh, how do we stay strong here in Israel? And sometimes, like when President Obama came on the scene, he did a lot of stuff to empower the bad guys. And yet that actually caused the Arab Spring, which caused the disillusion of many powerful Arab entities. It caused the civil war in Syria, making it a much weaker country. Uh, the, the, the terrorism that happened in Egypt caused it to stop being a tourist attraction and a lot of its factories shut down. And so therefore that became a much weaker state. When I was a kid, Egypt and Syria were very powerful and scary states. So President Obama came to empower anti-Israel forces. He ended up disempowering them. Uh, and so sometimes people try to hurt us, but it goes against their, against what their, uh, their interests, their wishes, like the Purim story. Uh, and I, I want to tell you that when we say Iran, we're also saying a misnomer because don't forget Iranian people, Iranian people, detest the regime, detest this regime. And so many of them would be let, want to see themselves freed from this regime. I think that we could count on the Iranian people as being allies of Israel, certainly not the regime, but the people. Mm, thank you. Okay, uh, Dennis, if you can unmute yourself. Then we've got Ron, Jeff, Ruthie, and Ruven. What? Right. I'll try my to my answer shorter. Hello, Yashai. Uh, Howdy. I, I'd want you to put on an American hat, even though you you only have an American accent. Uh, I want to make the assumption, firstly, uh, Biden wins. Uh, he's won. Uh, and there's no challenge. I want to add a further uh, 
supposition, and that is that Biden does not... He's 77. He seems to be on the edge of dementing. Uh, he may have to step aside well before his term is, is over. You then have Kamala Harris, who is further to the left. Uh, if Biden is a, a clone of, of Obama, then certainly Harris is to the left of that. There is the, therefore the, the possibility that she might ask that the embassy be moved back to Tel Aviv, uh, uh, she may want to force upon Israel further discussions and negotiations with the Palestinians. How do you see that playing out? Is Israel impregnable from its current position in the face of American negative policy? Well, Dennis, the good news is that we've we've had a lot of experiences. As I was laying out beforehand, it's it's not like it's not like a a, a Biden Harris administration is something that we've never dealt with. Um, we've dealt with 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 similar, you know, we we had Clinton and we had Obama and we and and I think the the uh, the the original father of them all, Jimmy Carter, still alive, still ticking, you know, still ticking, um, and uh, I think that we've learned a lot in Israelis. Israelis used to buy much more into um, the idea that the American president wants something and we have to do that. And that's where the Sinai, uh, the Sinai land giveaway to Egypt was born uh, under, under the Begin and Sadat agreements that were kind of foisted upon them by Carter. If you, read about, if you read about it, I think Israel's in a different place. Israel's in a different place, both regionally and also internally. It's, it's a little bit more... Um, I have the Hebrew word in my head, but I can't think of the English one, which is just more internally tough, a little bit more rugged, a little bit more calloused, and, and a little bit less willing to, to bend in, in that kind of way, especially coming in the heels of the Trump administration, which I think really, as I said before, showed us a way forward. So I'm not too scared about that. Uh, I think that, I think that, um, I think that the, I think that the real, the real danger by a Obama, by a uh, Biden Harris administration is for America, and I, I think that uh, for, for America is the one that that is going to have to deal with 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 really the the divisiveness and the maybe the uh, the um, large scope uh, voter fraud. That I don't know. I really don't know. And again, I don't want to get into that because it's just not my business. Uh, but I think that we're going to be able to deal with that. Obviously, we're doing our best to already, already uh, inoculate people from the idea of a two-state solution. We've been doing that forever. And uh, the Palestinian Authority has done a great job of teaching us what a bad idea it is to give land to them or to their, uh, uh, you know, their twin brother, Hamas. And so, so I think that that's, that's, that's uh, one thing. I don't think the embassy is ever moving back. I think that that's... You know what? Let's just say maybe the Trump administration... If they don't get back into power, maybe they gave us a great send off, a great send off, put us in the right track. And I hope that we'll keep on going with that track. Okay, Ron, um, please unmute yourself. Uh, hi, can you hear me? Yep. Okay. Um, hello, Yishai, good evening. My name is Ron. Um, we talk a lot about um, the alliance, uh, the, the you know the relationship between Israel and um, and the United States, um, but we often don't talk about the European Union, which is the biggest trading mm. partner for Israel, and they tend to be more Palestinians than the Palestinians. They were cold about the Abraham Accords, and uh, just last week they referred and they voted in the United Nations. They voted to uh, call the Quartel Haram al Sharif. Um, and give it the, um, which I consider to be an anti-Judaic, rather not just an anti-Israeli, but an anti-Judaic um, resolution. How will Israel deal with this, given the economic realities? And um, what would happen to um, Judea Samaria E1 with building programs over the next few years, given uh, the fact that the European Union is more likely to be pretty close to the ideas of Biden and Harris? First thing, I like your term anti-Judaic. I, I may, I may borrow that term. I like it. Uh, I like, I like the sound of that. I think it, it resonates nicely. Um, I, I like terminology. Terminology is important, so that, that's I'd like that. 
Um, I, I, your question is really in the same line as the last question, which is how are we going to deal with it? And my answer is, is the same, that we we dealt with it in the past. We'll keep going. So, look, sometimes the world is with it. Like there's very rarely the world is with us. This Trump thing was an aberration, right? Mm -hmm. So it's not like we're so totally unused to going at it alone and, and keep, keep uh, you know, pr pushing it forward. Uh, it, it, so we are, we, are, we are pretty, you know, ready to, to fight again. We are doing our best. You know, one of the most important things in this whole, in this whole formula is our children. How do we educate our children? And I think that you could see by the Israeli, Israeli voting patterns that there's more and more Israelis that are nationalists, that are traditional, that are, you would call it conservative. We just use that term less here. Um, and so our politics, our internal politics are moving so-called rightward or to more nationalistically. And that's very, very important. But regarding to Europe, I mean, they are fools. It, 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 they are so obsessed. And, and by the way, it's not all of Europe. We're talking Western Europe. We have an Eastern Europe, uh, folks like Hungary and the Ukraine, and, and sometimes Poland, we get in a fight with them a little bit, but still we have a good relationship with Poland and the Czech Republic and the Eastern Bloc countries. It turns out, by the way, that the Hungarians were not anti-Semitic. They were just xenophobic, meaning to say they really don't like others in general, uh, including Jews in their country. Uh, but, uh, but, they, uh, but when we are our own ethnic national state like them, and we're both battling the, the jihad, um, we have a great alliance with, with them, with, with people, even in Austria, even in Austria, Sebastian Kurtz, you know, a great ally of Israel. So we have allies and you see what's happening in France. They're finally, 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 finally starting to wake up. Hey, I think we have a problem here, you know? And so, and so, and they have a major problem. Um, so, so we have allies. Let's also remember other allies like India, uh, which is a, a big Democracy uh, has has an interest in technology. A lot of Israelis visit there, and also has a has a Muslim problem vis-a-vis -vis, uh, Pakistan and and internal you know jihadism. Uh, I think I, did you hear this this story? I, I don't know. I don't. I forgot the details of it. But recently, uh, the Prime Minister of of India uh, was part of a big event where they built a a Hindu uh, shrine on top of a a burnt down mosque, which was on top of a Hindu shrine. And so I liked that very much. It was like, to me, this was a sign we're building the third temple. You know, they burnt down our shrine. They built their shrine. We, you know, maybe we, maybe somehow that gets replaced and we celebrate our shrine. The point is India sometimes knows how to be vociferous about and clear about who the boss is. And they're an ally of ours as well. Also, we have international Christians. My good friend, Josh Reinstein is the head of the Christian Allies Caucus. And there are Christians in South America, in Africa, in your country, in England, who are part of the idea, part of the idea that, that God is, is bringing the Jewish people back to the land of Israel. And they're connected on that level. Um, we even have regional allies like Azerbaijan, which is a Muslim country that, that buys arms from Israel. In fact, we just got into hot water with another ally of ours, which is Armenia, uh, about selling arms to Azerbaijan. So um, we have other allies. We're going to rely on them. I think that more and more people, more and more countries are going to start coming around that, uh, that it's more useful to be friends with Israel because we have a very deep biblical command, which is if you can't beat them, join them, okay? And since Israel is not really that beatable, it seems like, for all of its internal squabbling, it's really, it's really a country that's still there and it's thriving. Damn it, it's thriving, okay? And you could see it when you walk the streets of Israel and our enemies see it, they're not that dumb. And so, so okay, you know, there's another scare and another scare and, and Biden-Harris and the Europeans and all that, but all their stuff turns to mush. You know, I sometimes want to shake their heads and say, what is the point of your endless war? It's, it's nothing, You've, you're not, you didn't beat us in the Holocaust, you haven't beat us in the last uh, uh, 100 years of Zionism. W what is the point of your efforts? It's just a waste of your time. And in the meantime, it's your countries that are, that are starting to uh, fall apart at the seams. I say the same thing to Arabs a lot of times. I say, what is the point of your war against us? We are doing fine. And in the meantime, your civilization, look at your great countries. They're falling apart. Is there, is there, I say to my Arab neighbors, I say, is there one good Arab country? Oh, look, it's the UAE. That's like the one good Arab country. 
and look look what consciousness they're coming to what realizations they're coming to mm. so what can, what can i say to you you know what i mean i'm i'm not i'm not going to be i'm not going to be kept up at night because you know the the germans are uh, are still anti israel it's just not going to keep me up at night okay um jeff i'll come to you but just before we do i want to pick up on a, a question that's on the chat group and it says, and it asks you, Yeshai, how does Israel mitigate the effects of the joint list or any other left-leaning entity um, uh, internal to Israel who are set to undermine Israel's normal, norm, normalcy with the Muslim nations? So what's the, what does the joint list have to, joint list have to say about all of, uh, all of this that's going on? That is a very good question. That is a very good question. Because that, that is a very interesting question to me because... The joint list, uh, which is uh, three Arab parties in our Knesset. I was just in the Knesset on Monday, and I saw them all chatting and smiling. And you have the leader of that party. His name is um, Ayman Uda. He actually comes from the same place where I come from in Israel. And I know his uh, larger tribe and family. Uh, and he is anti-normalization basically anti-Israel, calls Israel every name in the book and is always pushing for a two-state solution. But interestingly, just last night, as you're asking that question, just last night I saw a whole show about one of the other leaders in that party whose name is, whose name is Abbas, uh, oh, wait one second, a rabbi in Brooklyn has the same last name as his, Mansur, Abbas Mansur, that's what it is, Abbas Mansur. And this guy, Abbas Mansur, is an alternative leader in the joint list party. Now, the joint list also has Ahmed Tibi, just famous anti-Israel people. Ahmed Tibi has a big poster of Yasser Arafat in his office in the Knesset. And look, to, to me, the anti-Israel Arabs that, li that are Israeli Arabs really undermine everything. Why do they undermine everything? Because we're saying n Arabs that have an opportunity to live a decent life in Israel should be pro-Israel. But it turns out that even with good education and with good, um, with good opportunity, a lot of times they turn anti-Israel. At the same time, this guy uh, that I mentioned, uh, Abbas Mansour, he is actually pull, pushing a different line, which is more in the Abraham Accords style line. And he's saying, by the way, do you, do you folks know what is the number one problem in the Arab-Israeli society that they want Israel to help them with? It's internal Arab violence, Arab on Arab violence. The number one issue in the Arab sector is, hey, Israel, help us put an end to the violence in our community. And at the same time, they're like, well, but we're anti-Israel because we don't respect Israel. But can you help us with the violence that, that, you know, we'd love it to turn on you, but it turns inwardly on us. Can you help us stop that and mitigate that? I find that to be... There's something, there's something absurd about it. This, I bet you an Australian or a British person could say better than me about the absurdity of, on the one hand, you know, being anti-Israel, on the other hand, asking us to help them deal with their internal violence. Um, there are good voices in the Arab world. They are often marginalized and they can't be heard. This guy named Abbas, he's starting, no, nothing to do with, with Mahmoud Abbas. He is, he is starting to have a different tone. But I would ask a question, which is, did the experiment of giving everybody, uh, Israeli Arabs, the vote, which was a very hurried decision in the 50s, did it work out exactly correctly? Or should Israel think of itself more like a, like a Japan or like a uh, Armenia or ethnic national states in our region that really aren't so quick to give forces that want to undermine them the same rights to vote in their country and to undermine it? Now, what I'm saying is, seemingly radical but uh i would think about it i would think about did did that work out did it work out especially given the context that some people want us to give the vote to palestinian arabs if we ever uh are able to to uh, uh to incorporate and, and be sovereign in judea and samaria what do we do with those arabs i think that the experiment has showed that it's not so simple to give all peoples in the land you know an equal equal footing in the vote and maybe we should find other ways of giving them rights but not necessarily with, uh, with, with, being, with and being empowered to undermine the Jewish character of the state of Israel. So it's, it's, I, it's, it's a very good question. It's a question that I'm very interested in myself. Uh, lastly, I just want to say I know a lot of Arabs, including from the village where Ayman Uda is from. I know the, the, the chief of the, 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 the 
he's not an imam, he's a mufti there in, uh, his name is uh, Sharif uh, uh, Uda, and he is a friend of mine, and he is very embarrassed by Ayman Uda, and said to me, the Abraham Accords is the only way forward. So he's the religious leader in the place of Ayman Uda. Sadly, not always great leaders, politicians get to the top, but that's who it is today. Okay. Um, now, look, we are coming up to time. Um, Jeff and Ruven, I, I mean, I, you have questions every week. So perhaps I might let Ruthie have a, a question uh, and then David, and, and that might just about take us out. So I'm sorry, but we, uh, we just don't have enough time. So Ruthie, please unmute yourself and ask your question. Hi, Vishai, you're against a two-state solution. How do you see the Palestinian issue resolved given that the reproduction rate is so high? And as you mentioned, are we going towards an apartheid state ethnic state, what are we going to do? And Thank which you. will be against Jewish values? Well, the first thing I would say, that last thing you said, uh, Jewish values, I would say, let's put that as a question mark. Is it or against, is it or is it not against Jewish values? I want to tell you something about Jewish values. I want to tell you a little story. I was in uh, New York right after that shooting in Pittsburgh. And I said, everybody in this synagogue should have a gun, or at least you should have two guns you know, somebody should be carrying a gun. And everybody said, looked at me and said, no, guns, ew, it's abhorrent in a synagogue and that's against Jewish values. That same week, I was in California in San Diego and I said, everybody should have a gun here. You guys should protect yourself. They're like, what? of course. And the people started pulling out their guns and showing it to me. They're like, it's Jewish values to have a gun. Of course, we have a gun here. But what was the difference? One was living in the northeast of America, which is liberal, and one was living in, in San Diego, which is, which, is, which is conservative. And therefore, they had a different concept of what Jewish values were based on where they were living. Well, Jewish values, that's a very tricky thing. Uh, uh, are, are we a Western-style country or are we an Eastern-style country? We're an amalgam. We're an amalgam, okay? So how, how, do you, how do you solve the problem? And this is an article that I wrote in, in the New York Times about alternatives to the two-state solution. And I gave a few examples. I'll just give some of them very quickly. Uh, one of them is that the two-state solution has already been done. The two-state solution uh, happened already in 1923 when 77% of the land that was supposed to be the land of Israel was given to the Hashemites by the British uh, to make an Arab state of which today 80% recognize themselves, uh, identify themselves as Palestinian. So there's Jewish land that was given away to Arabs and they have a Palestinian state. It's called Jordan. Jordan is Palestine. In fact, most of the Arabs that live today in the West Bank came from Jordan when Jordan pushed in, took over our land, which was never recognized, their, their annexation of the land in 1948 till 1967. We say, why don't the Arabs that live in the West Bank get back their Jordanian citizenship, but live in Israel as Israeli residents? I was a resident for many years in America. If you ever, Ruthie, moved to Japan, you would forever be a resident because you're non-Japanese. Nobody ever says Japan is an apartheid because they don't give uh, white people uh, the vote. It's an ethnic national state. There are many ethnic national states. Nobody says anything about Armenia or Poland or Hungary because they're ethnic national states. Why? Because they're trying to protect their ethnicity. We are an embattled ethnicity. Don't we deserve less than one half of 1% of the Middle East of our ancestral land to be an ethnic national state? So we say, here's a simple way to solve it. Give them their Jordanian citizenship back, but stay here. Live as Israeli residents. Not so bad. Every Palestinian I know says all I want is Israeli residency. But vote in your Palestinian state next door, which is Jordan. That's one example. Another example is give them local rule over cities like Hebron, Ramallah, Shechem. Let them have their mayor, their courts, their thing. Of course, it'll be Israel. And they'll pay taxes to Israel and be part of Israel, but they'll feel that they are living in their tribal way and they're in, in, in the way that, that Arabs uh, 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 rule themselves. By the way, Ruthie, let me just ask you a question. Uh, one second, hold on. Leah, can you turn on the volume, please? That's my daughter. She's on Zoom in school. Um, let me ask you one question, Ruthie. Which Arab states have run democracy and have the vote? Let's think about it. <laughs> The answer is zero, not a one, not one, not one Arab country runs any kind of form of democracy. So if we don't give them democracy that makes us an apartheid state, it's absurd. It's an absurdity. 
there is there is no democracy or votes. Even the UAE, which is a very forward thinking country, is nothing nothing even close to a democracy. It just doesn't work that way. They rule themselves in clans by strong leaders. Okay, so here's Hebron, rule yourselves here. Here's Shechem, rule yourselves here. But that doesn't mean that we need to give you the vote in our Knesset to decide for us if we should keep kosher or Shabbat in the, in the army or in the, or in the government. That's absurd. I don't think anybody came out of the Holocaust uh, thinking to themselves, uh, wow, I just came out of the, the, the fires of Auschwitz. Let's make a democratic state and make sure the Arabs have the vote in it. In the meantime, they're trying to kill us. Let's just be real. Israel's an ethnic national state created to defend our ethnic minority in this region. That's the way I understand it. I don't use the term Jewish and democratic. To me, the democratic aspect is smaller. It's a way that we rule ourselves. Just like Japan is Japanese and democratic, but nobody ever says Japanese and democratic. They just say Japanese. They run a democracy for themselves. So I think that there, there are many, and, there are, and I've given, I have at least three more suggestions about how to move forward. I'll, let me finish off Ruth with one more phrase for you, okay? What's the real vision for peace in the Middle East? What's the real vision for a relationship with the Arabs in the Middle East? The real vision is a strong ethnic national Jewish state surrounded by strong ethnic national Arab states. We want them to succeed. We want our 400 million Arab neighbors to succeed. It's not going to be successful through, through chipping away at Israel. That's not going to be good for anybody. We want a strong ethnic national Jewish state with minorities that are empowered to have uh, to have uh, 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 upward mobility and good health, health care, et cetera, et cetera, good education. But don't try to undermine the Jewish state. And thereby, when you give us the respect of having our Jewish state, you will be blessed yourselves. And we'll have strong Arab states, a strong, beautiful Lebanon, a strong Syria, a strong Egypt, et cetera, et cetera, a strong UAE, you know, a normal area. That's what's going to help us flourish. Not trying to erode our Jewish rights in the land of Israel. That's my opinion. Um, David, uh, we'll, we'll make you the final question, so please unmute yourself and ask your question. Yishai is just telling his daughter off. Uh, Yishai, uh, thank you very much today on behalf of everybody. With the uh, deals that have been made with the Arab countries, the normalisation, uh, Netanyahu has made a promise to hold off on declaring any sovereignty of any of the West Bank. How is that affecting your uh, advocacy efforts in uh, achieving, which is the very thing that you want to do, that, that, uh, that sovereignty of the West Bank? Sure. Good question, David. I just want to say, David, that um, uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu made it clear many times, he said it many times, that this, what, this, this thing that he said to the UAE that we're not going to declare sovereignty was a limited time phenomenon. And, and about two or three weeks ago, was it? Uh, the Israeli government announced 5,000 new apartments, new uh, um, units in Judea and Samaria to be built, including in, in the town that I live in. So, um, and we have about uh, 90 new apartments slated to be built in Hebron. So, look, maybe Prime Minister Netanyahu didn't declare sovereignty, but the most important thing that happened, I, and I'm, I'm ashamed that I didn't mention this earlier, which is the Pompeo Doctrine, which recognized the international law legality of Jewish communities in Judea and Samaria. Uh, this was enunciated by Secretary of State Pompeo. This was in America's view of what international law is, that it's, that it's not inconsistent with international law. All that's fancy words for saying that the United States recognizes Jewish rights in Judea and Samaria, which makes sense because Jews are from Judea, right? It's just a perfect sense. Sensical. And Oh, hold on just one second. I had a little... Oh. One, one second, friends. I had a little technical uh, glitch here. Okay, no, we can, can hear you, Shai. Okay. We just can't see you. Okay. That's it. There we go. Uh, you, you see, that's the Jewish people. We, we, we fall down, we get back up again. <laughs> um, um, and, so, and so let's just, again, I, I kind of want to help everybody be real. Let's be real. Really, there are... 600,000 Jews living in Judea and Samaria, if you include Eastern Jerusalem. Um, so that's one out of 10 Israelis. And we're going to keep growing here. This is our ancestral homeland. This is where we're from. We yearn to come back to these places. Yes, there are Arabs here. Big deal. We'll be able to deal with them, give them decency and respect as long as they give us decency and respect back. 
decent Arabs that want to live with Israel and be what I call post-jihadist are welcome to it, uh, are, are welcome to a relationship with us. Those who want to fight with us, they can fight and they'll lose. And that's part of the ethos of Israel as well, which is we're ready to fight. Uh, we're, we're ready to defend ourselves and we're ready to defend ourselves for the next uh, 4,000 years. So, um, so, so that, that's my answer to you. My answer is, yeah. okay, he didn't, he didn't announce sovereignty yet, but a prime minister will, because this is, there's a, there's a justice to our claim. There's a historical justice, a legal justice, a religious justice, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, what, what my old Greek landlord in New York City used to call the call of the blood. Our blood calls to come back to these places and to hold on to them. And uh, I want to also uh, just say that efforts like uh, the AJAs in, in places like Australia make a big difference for us. That kind of advocacy makes a, a global, global atmosphere uh, when there's a fight against sponsoring Palestinian Authority terror, uh, or the push to recognize Jerusalem as the capital of Israel, coming all the way from Australia, makes an impact, a global impact on us. And more and more people are, are going to recognize the beauty, the majesty, the, the, the general goodness of Israel, and are going to line up with it. Thank you very much. Look, we're going to have to wrap it up. Yisha, I want to thank you again for joining us. Um, you, you just talk so much sense. I always enjoy listening to you. Um, and so thank you on behalf of everybody. I'll hand back to David to just uh, make some closing remarks. Okay, look, thank you, Alan, and uh, Yishai, look, it's, uh, it's wonderful that you could join us. I apologise profusely for mucking up the, uh, the time zone calculation, my fault entirely, uh, but you've uh, done us a, a mitzvah there because I'll have to correct some correspondence for future guests. <laughs> um, it's always wonderful uh, connecting with you. We did have a tour uh, organised of Israel um, and along came coronavirus in March. Uh, one of the aspects of the tour was to visit Hebron and have uh, Yishai Fleischer as a guide around uh, Maratha Machpela. Uh, I hope we can uh, reinstitute that in the not too distant future and uh, engage you as a guide on your home ground, uh, Yishai, that would be wonderful. Now, it would be my greatest pleasure, David. I, I can't wait to see you and the rest of the AJA and the good folks from Australia. And uh, Corona has kept us a little bit divided, but at the end, uh, how do we say absence makes the heart grow fonder? And I think that Jews and lovers of Israel throughout the world are yearning to stay connected to Israel uh, through, through a Zoom like this one, through the AJA, and through coming back soon after Corona. Amen. Ne mm -hmm. As we say, we next, year, next year in person. That's what we say, next yeah. year in person. Hashanaba. <laughs> And um, just finishing off to tell people what's happening uh, uh, next week, we have a very, very special guest um, who probably needs uh, no introduction. Uh, Senator Jim Molan is uh, one of the greatest uh, military commanders that Australia has had. He's received awards both from the Australian government uh, and the American government. He was commander of the Allied forces uh, in Iraq. And uh, I learned recently uh, speaking with him that uh, he's also been consulted by the Israeli government uh, because of his experience uh, in the Middle East. So we'll be connecting with him next week, talking about uh, national security issues. And he interprets that quite broadly. Um, from both an from an Australian perspective, and he has some comments about um, security for Israel as well. And finally, if anyone here is not yet doing these three things, uh, please support AJA, uh, like and follow the AJA Facebook page. If you're not yet on our email list, simply send an email to office at jewishassociation.org.au and we'll add you. And of course, um, if you're not yet a member or if you're able to help us in a tangible way um, to make a small donation through the website, uh, that'd be more than welcome. So that's all, Alan, and uh, we can wrap up. Okay, thanks, David. Thanks, uh, thanks again, Yishai. Thanks, Michael. Uh, on that note, we'll say good night and uh, we look forward to seeing you all again next week. So from me and everybody else, it's good evening to you all. Bye for now. Shalom.
Shalom. Thanks, Yishai. It was great.